This morning's call to worship comes from Isaiah 35. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Good morning and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Fairfield. We're very glad that you were able to connect with us this morning on all of our different platforms, whether it's Facebook, our website, our Zoom conference call, or our YouTube channel. We pray that you would continue to connect with us, and, and we are looking for all sorts of ways to stay in contact with you. Uh, so if you would like to, you're welcome to sign up for our Monday emails, uh, which you can find on our website, and those include all of the things that we've got going on over the course of the week. We've got our Wednesday Bible study, we have a Thursday prayer meeting, and starting not tomorrow, but next week we're going to be having a Monday uh, Bible study on our book study on Tim Keller's The Reason for God. It's a study that will meet for an hour every Monday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for six weeks starting on May 18th. It's a 20-minute video online followed by a 40-minute discussion via Zoom, and we'll have more information coming out to you on that in the near future. And so now for a special invitation, I'm going to invite forward Anna Fedorik. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Um, I just wanted to announce a few other things um, that we are going to be starting and doing virtually um, as we miss seeing each other's faces, but we're grateful um, of opportunities to virtually connect. So this past Friday, we had our second game night and those will be continuing every other Friday at 7 p.m. Um, so be sure to check your email for the Zoom link um, and join in for that. They Families are invited, children, adults, everyone. Um, and then this week, I will be starting a virtual story time. So check the Monday email for more details on that. It'll be via Zoom. Um, and I hope that you've noticed by now, but we are having virtual Sunday school. Every single Sunday, wherever you're streaming our service, um, you should be able to click on the link um, and view a virtual Sunday school lesson for children and families as well. Thank you so much. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins to God, who is faithful and just, he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Today's scripture is Psalm 31 verses 1 to 5 and 15 and 16. The opening line of this psalm effectively summarizes the entire psalm and much of the Psalter. Entrusting his life to God, the psalmist arrives at what the introduction calls happy. Let us pray. O oh God, by your Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. 
Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. second lesson comes from Peter's first letter, the second chapter, beginning in the second verse. And Peter tells the faithful to rid themselves of impurities and to seek a growing faith. More likely, the first words that many of us learned was, Jesus loves me, this I know, or God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for this food. And these first words and actions of loving Christian people have led many of us to the beginning of our faith journey. And so hear now the Word of God beginning in the second verse. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to Him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame, To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We give God the praise and the glory for that beautiful anthem. Thank you. Discovering what our gifts are and then putting them to use for God's glory. That's what ministry is all about. In the Greek, the word ministry comes from the root word for deacon or one who serves. Each one of us has gifts that we can use and share for God's glory. And Peter says that we have been made the chosen people of God, a holy priesthood acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Peter uses six terms in our lesson this morning to describe the followers of Jesus. Living stones, holy priesthood, royal race, royal priesthood, holy nation, and God's own people. As living stones, we are part of an ongoing construction project that God is still building with Jesus as the chief cornerstone and foundation. And just like anything that's constructed, we are at times in need of renovation, repair, being cared for, especially by those who love us. Peter reminds us that the difference between Christians and non-Christians is not that we see different things, but that we see the same things differently. Those who believe and those who do not believe both see Jesus Christ, the rock. For believers, the rock is the cornerstone of, uh, or the capstone of our lives as individuals and the community. For unbelievers, the rock is simply to be rejected. What makes the difference between the two ways of seeing is faith. And second, we are referred to as a holy priesthood. In Old Testament times, the priests offered sacrifices of animals as suitable offerings to God. In the New Testament, the offering is of ourselves. Paul is writing, uh, in writing to the church in Rome, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to, the, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Peter also refers to us as a chosen race. God has chosen us, even though we aren't worthy to be considered. God chose us. Come to think of it, the church is the only organization in the world that accepts as members only those who were not qualified to belong to it. And fourth, we are a royal priesthood. We're not only a holy priesthood, but we're also a royal one. And what this means is that we have direct access to God. We can turn to God whenever and wherever we want. We don't need a pastor or a priest to speak to God on our behalf. We can go to God on our own for ourselves. Peter also refers to us as a holy nation. Our spiritual citizenship is beyond this world. In just a few short days and weeks ahead, many seniors will be graduating from high school and college. And like most graduates, they will receive gifts, some monetary, some material, such as uh, things that they may need uh, while at college, or some intangible gifts, such as love and well wishes and support. They will receive many and various gifts and congratulations. Now, we all love to get gifts. We don't always like to write thank you notes, though. The bigger the gift, however, the more likely we are to thank the giver. However, the biggest and most important gifts that we've ever received have come from a giver that is largely taken for granted and seldom thanked. These are the gifts that we have received from God. And whether we realize it or not, what we, what we are, what we have, what we've accomplished, and what we will accomplish in the future is a gift from God. Paul writes to the Corinthian church. He says there are different gifts, different, uh, different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. 
There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives this ability to all for their particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. The Spirit gives one person a message full of wisdom, while to another person the same Spirit gives a message full of knowledge. One and the same Spirit gives faith to one person, while to another person He gives the power to heal. The Spirit gives one person the power to work miracles, to another the gift of speaking God's message, and yet another the ability to tell the difference between gifts that come from the Spirit and those that do not. One person He gives the ability to speak in strange tongues, and to another He gives the ability to interpret what is said. But it is one and the same Spirit who does this. As He wishes, He gives a different gift to each person. The central message is clear that God is the giver of our talents and God has distributed these talents among us in various degrees according to our gifts. We have different abilities, different skills, and different talents. We all know that. Not everyone excels in all things. Everything that we have, whether it's a skill or a talent or even a disability, is a gift from God. God has granted to each one of us a unique ability to do something. Something that no one else can do quite like we can. We will use our God-given gifts to succeed. Now you might use your musical talents to enrich your lives. You might put your technical skills to good use. You might use your gift of caring and healing to help others. You might use your mechanical knowledge to build things. Now one thing I hope that we don't do is hide our gifts as if we were ashamed or afraid to use them. Matthew tells the parable of a master who had three servants who were each given different amounts of talents. Two of the servants doubled their talents. But don't be like the foolish servant who in this parable hid his gift from his master because he was afraid of losing it. We should be like the wise servants and invest it and make it productive. Someday, God will want to settle up with us for the talents given to us. And what will we, what will we tell God? God gave each of us a gift. And the way we thank God is to use those gifts wisely and to their fullest. God wants us to take what God has given and multiply it. God does not want us to waste our gifts or hide them or use them in a manner that does not bring satisfaction and glory to God. That way we can thank God for the greatest of all gifts is to use our talents for the service of others and for God's glorification. In other words, simply make the world a better place for having been here. Make a difference in someone's life rather than your own. God isn't against having success in life or making money or being famous. What God wants is for us to realize that everything that we do, everything that we achieve is due to the gifts and talents given to us by God. What God wants is for us to show our thanks by loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, by being a good friend, by giving to someone in need without expecting something in return by treating others with respect and being humble in all that we do. Don't ever ask, what's in it for me? But rather ask, what can I do to serve? Each of us has been given a talent which is unique to us. What you have been, what you are today, what you will ultimately be is a gift from God. How your gifts will be used, what ministries you shall serve, perform and what works you shall do and what heights you may attain I can't tell the mystery in our life may it often be conscious of the unfolding grace within us loyal to the values that we have acquired and a pride to this community and to this church the best that we are today everything that we possess within us comes from God May we respond to this wonderful and gracious gift and be thankful. We are God's own people. We are God's own possession. 
God is the owner and we are the manager of the gifts that God has given to us to use for God's edification and glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. join me in stating what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's right that we bring our cares, concerns, and celebrations to God in prayer. There are a number of folks that we need to remember this morning for Martha Judd, that's Susan Marshall's mother, for comfort and peace. Also, the uh, family of Bryce uh, Co Costantino, uh, that's Michael Costantino family, for comfort on the recent, recent passing of their 19-year-old son, Bryce. Also, we want to wish uh, all mothers today a very happy Mother's Day. And also, uh, hopefully you saw our uh, email this week in recognition of Teacher Appreciation Week. We pray for all those in our congregation who are teachers or who work in education. And we thank them for their love and dedication going far above and beyond for our children and youth. Also, for ongoing prayer concerns, we continue to pray for strength and comfort and healing for Mark Addy, Miller Carroll, Frank Chismadia, Laura Cook, Sam Dilcher, Janet Hollendorfer, Dr. Jennifer, Jessica, the Huth family, Keelan Kohler, Matt Marshall, Daniela Moscolino, Bob Olson, Dana, Julie Smith, Agnes and Terry Sullivan, the Trefelner family, as well as those working in the medical fields and first responders. We also want to continue to pray for our pastor nominating committee as they seek to discern God's will for future pastoral leadership, as well as for our nation and world and all those who have been affected by COVID-19. Let us go to God in prayer. God of truth, in you we see the one who sent you. Be a firm foundation for your church that we may be your holy people. God of life, through you all things were made. Reorder your creation according to your mercy that all may live in your peace. God of faith, your cross is a stumbling block for some, but to us who believe it is the gate through which we must pass on the way to salvation. Walk with us that we might keep on keeping on. God of hope, even though you were rejected, you now hold all things in place. Share with us a sign of your promise and glory that we might endure our trials. Enfold the grieving. Lift up those who despair. Bind the wounds of the brokenhearted. Fill the empty. God of love, be a firm foundation for your church that we may be your holy people. We ask this in all our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are moments when the heavens seem to open to us and we sense the vast possibilities for life that God offers. We long to teach our, or to reach our God-given potential and to offer that opportunity to others. The tithes and the offerings that we bring today are devoted to that purpose. Let us give with joy.
Let us pray. We commit ourselves to you, gracious God, as we dedicate material gifts that represent our labor. When we remember Jesus as the cornerstone of the spiritual house you are seeking to build in our midst, we are eager to help. Bless this offering that your mighty acts may be proclaimed to all the world. Amen.